All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Maureen Conway. I am Vice President for Policy Programs here at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program. I'm really thrilled to welcome you to today's conversation on the justice system and jobs. Um, at the Economic Opportunities Program, our mission is to advance promising policies, strategies, and ideas that can help low and moderate Americans uh, connect to and thrive in our changing economy. Um, and we have two basic approaches to doing that. Uh, one is that we look a lot at um, business ownership and entrepreneurship as an economic opportunity strategy. Um, but the other is that we uh, look at jobs and worth as a key source of economic opportunity in the United States. Uh, and in the Working in America series, of course, we focus primarily on that second strategy of what's going on in the world of work. Um, and, and really, it's critically important for despite a lot of the conversation around work and how work is changing, and, and, and it is changing, right? But nonetheless, it is the case that a decent job, uh, a, a wage or salary job, is critical for uh, the vast majority of working Americans to make a decent living. Um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, for households in their prime working age of uh, between 25 and 64, wage and salary income accounts for upwards of 80% of the income that that household has to rely on, on average, right? So, so this, is, this is the main way that uh, most American households have the income that they need to pay for the basics of housing, transportation, food, uh, child care, and so on. Um, and of course, in the US, uh, the job is a context of, of more than just uh, money, right? So this is where a lot of people get their, their health insurance, life insurance, um, opportunities to save for retirement, and you know some basic sort of insurances that helps people manage the um, life events that, that happen to us without sort of tremendous economic dislocation. And just as important, work for many is a source of social connection, uh, identity, sense of uh, capability and mastery and self-worth, and often of purpose. Um, to quote Freud, uh, love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. Um, so this centrality of work to building a good life um, as the foundation for healthy families and communities, uh, as the cornerstone to a vibrant, stable, and prosperous society, uh, these inspire our conversations in the Working in America series, and today's conversation is indeed so inspired. As we sit in the shadow of a contentious Supreme Court conversation, it is really worth considering the role that courts play in shaping our world of work. Uh, how do their decisions influence work for the uh, roughly 150 million uh, wage and salary workers in the United States? Um, what are the assumptions, frameworks, and key considerations that guide how those decisions are made? Um, so we think those are really important questions to have a conversation about in this moment. Um, if you're not a close court watcher as, okay, I'm, I'm not, right? I'm not a lawyer, um, but I love lawyers. My father's a lawyer. Uh, um, I'm not an economist either, but I love them too, and I'm married to one. Um, okay, um, so anyway, uh, uh, we do have a little background on, um, on uh, some, uh, some recent cases and some major pieces of the employment law if, you, if you'd like a little refresher on that. Um, I, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, the Walmart Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and Prudential Financial for their support of the Working in America series. Uh, their support is critical to our being able to bring this series to you. Um, I also want to uh, remind everybody to please uh, silence your phones, um, but please do tweet. Our hashtag is TalkGoodJobs. Um, okay, I am now going to uh, uh, turn it over to our panel. We have a fabulous panel today. I'm just going to do a quick names to faces introduction to everybody um, so that you know who's who sitting up here, but you have their bios and in your, in your materials, and I'm, I'm sure uh, if you've had a chance to take a look at them, you realize how fabulous they all are. So I will um, 
Start with Evan, closest to me. Uh, Evan Starr, Assistant Professor of Management and Organization at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. Uh, next to Evan, we have Christine Owens, Executive Director of the National Employment Law Project. Next to Christine, we have Oren Cass, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, and next to Oren, we have Sarita Gupta, uh, Co-Director, Jobs with Justice, and we are delighted to have moderating our conversation today, Lauren Weber, economics correspondent. Um, why do I have at the Wall Street Journal? Or, um, yeah, I'm like, why is that written down? Um, and I neglected to mention, because I and I promised I would, Oren is also a recent uh, author of The Once and Future Worker, A Vision for the Renewal of Work in America. Um, it's coming out in November, so check that out. And uh, delighted to turn it over to you now, Lauren. Great. So thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you for coming. Um, we are going to be discussing um, a handful of fairly disparate court cases today, uh, along with other avenues for making public policy. Um, the cases are disparate, but what unifies them all is that they all kind of come down to questions about uh, bargaining power and who comes to the table for uh, determining the relationship between employer and employee with what kind of leverage to determine, to set the terms for that relationship, to define that relationship. <clears throat> and I think pretty much all of the cases that we have today uh, touch on those questions and, and all of the major public policy questions of the moment in terms of work and working people. Um, another thing I want us to keep in mind during the discussion, both for the panelists and for the audience, is that in many ways, we're in a bifurcated labor market today. Um, whether you, If you have um, skills that are in high demand and you're a high wage worker, you have a different kind of leverage than if your skills are in lower demand or are sort of commodity skills. And so um, the question of worker and or employer and employee relationships is very different depending on which, uh, which part of that labor market you fall into. Um, we are talking today mostly about court decisions and policies and economics, but we're also talking about questions of work that are fundamental to who we are and fundamental to the quality of our lives. So um, as we get the conversation going, I want to ask each panelist before you answer the question I'm going to pose to you, tell us about the worst job you ever had, hopefully not your current one, and, um, and then you can sort of launch into your, to your answer to the more uh, substantive question of the day. So um, Evan, we'll start with you. You're an economist and you do research on contracts. Um, you've done a lot of research on non-competes and no poaching agreements. Um, before we get into the details of maybe some of the cases that have come up around that, can you talk a little bit about how economists think about contracts um, and like what, what drew you to this topic of research? Yeah, um, <clears throat> let me first start with, with my, um, <clears throat> I guess my worst job. <laughs> That's a hard question. I, when I was growing up, I loved um, like the pool, and I always dreamed of the lifeguards. I thought they were so cool, and I became a lifeguard, and it was terrible. It was so boring. You just sat there staring at people all day, and uh, I was just sorely, I didn't feel as cool as I thought those people were when I was a lifeguard, so <laughs> that was my worst job. Um, yeah, so most of my research is about the use and effects of non-competes and non-compete policy. Uh, and other kind of post-employment restrictive covenants generally, which try to uh, prohibit the worker from doing certain actions after they leave their job. And I guess what kind of drew me into this was that there's this age-old debate when it comes to non-competes, which began in the 1400s, which was when the first non-compete case was, where uh, basically firms are preventing workers from joining competitors after they leave their, their company. And on one hand, you've got some people who think that uh, this is a terrible thing for workers. The workers are being restrained from moving up in their chosen industry, and it's going to hurt them. And then you've got people who are very pro-contract, who see uh, workers as uh, uh, very much agents, having agency in what they agree to. And they would argue that workers would never agree to a contract that actually hurts them. And so we should see that non-competes and similar types of contracts are always associated with benefits for the worker. And so that's kind of why I got interested in this, because the debate really wasn't resolved, and it's still not today, but we have a lot more evidence. Uh, and so I was just trying to figure out wh where does the truth lie? Are both sides right? Where and when? And that's kind of what I've been working on. And have you answered that question? <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm making progress. OK. Yeah. Good. Happy Hopefully to we'll, talk about it later. <laughs> Hopefully we'll hear more about that. Um, Chris, you are a lawyer. Are you the only lawyer on our panel today? I think, I think you are. Oh, lawyer, Warren yeah. is also a lawyer. OK. Um, and your organization, National Employment Law Project, Project. Um, focuses on um, the role of legal decisions in shaping work lives, particularly for low-wage workers. 
I'm really curious about what major shifts you've seen um, over the last couple of decades or so in the kinds of um, employment law cases that are being brought to court and then how those cases are being decided. Sure. Well, let me start with my worst job. Oh, um, yes, of course. Thank you for remembering. <laughs> I, um, years ago, worked at Sears Roebuck, and I was on the sort of beginning wave of telemarketing, which I did not know when I went into the job. And uh, shortly after I started the job, I had to start doing cold calls to customers to try to sell things, which I always hated. But the week I decided to quit was the week that the two products I were, was supposed to be selling were decorated toilet lid covers and maternity <laughs> girdles. And I was out of there. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so I would say that the, um, the shift that I think has been underway for probably three decades now, um, but very dramatic shift away from the ability of workers to join together collectively uh, to resort to rely on the courts to both help interpret um, statutory protections and help enforce the law toward a much more atomized approach to uh, statutory enforcement, um, rights enforcement, um, either through, as we'll talk about a little later, um, forced arbitration agreements that prevent individuals from not only going into court themselves, but actually acting collectively through the arbitration process uh, to vindicate uh, wrongs that have been done to a whole class of people. Um, and then attacks on uh, the ability of unions to organize and represent their members, which I'm sure Sarita will speak to more. And even now, growing attacks on the ability of worker centers to represent their members. So I think this shift away from you know, the whole original body of civil rights law was based on class action litigation and the, the notion that through classes, individ, affected individuals operate as private attorneys general to build the law uh, and help ensure um, re delivery on the rights that are guaranteed by the law toward a much more individualized approach that makes it hard to act collectively and also hard to get into court in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, Oren, you work at the Manhattan Institute. You were an advisor to Mitt Romney. Um, you've criticized courts as being an, uh, fundamentally adversarial, is that right? A place to sort of resolve conflicts. Um, I'm curious if you think that, first of all, can you explain that and tell us if you think there's a better way? Uh, sure. Well, I guess to start with my worst job. My, my worst job by far was was refereeing fifth and sixth grade girls basketball, <laughs> including a game that ended seven to six in overtime. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, more, I, a little bit more seriously, you know, I think lawn mowing and, and all of that aside, I actually ended up on what would be traditionally considered a cushy white collar uh, office job, but but working with a client that essentially removed all predictability from the job, both in terms of what we were supposed to be doing and what hours of our lives we were supposed to be doing it in. And so on the one hand, I think that's very different than the sorts of on-time scheduling and, and challenges that retail workers face. But, but that dimension of it, just feeling like you didn't have control over where work fit into your life, was I think saying that for me, I found really defined what a, a bad job looked like. Um, you know, in terms of the role of courts, I think it's it's really important to understand that our court system isn't supposed to be a policy making apparatus, and I don't just mean that in the constitutional sense that we have a legislature, but that when cases come before courts, they are not set up to make good policy decisions necessarily, and the judges' ruling aren't there to make good policy decisions. And so, an example of this is the Epic Systems case that that we'll probably talk more about, which is the case that said employers could essentially contract away class action rights and require employees to arbitrate. Um, from the perspective of policymakers, we have a really interesting discussion, you know, a little bit to Evan's point about when is a contract willingly entered into, what are the benefits, what are the costs. If you look at how the Supreme Court decided the case, it's a statutory interpretation case. The, the fact that it's about employment isn't even necessarily relevant. You have the text of the Federal Arbitration Act, and you have the text of the National Labor Relations Act, and you're trying to make sense of how they've been interpreted historically and how they should relate to each other. And so 
there are a lot of good reasons we want our court system to decide those questions in very neutral, predictable, text-based ways. If we look to them to vindicate the interests of workers or build a better labor market, we're going to end up very disappointed. And so I think it's important that instead of asking the courts to go in and solve those problems for us, we, we recognize that they won't and turn the focus back to the legislature where you can actually have a policy debate about how you want the system to work. I'm not sure that would work in our current Congress. I mean, but we can we can get to that. I mean, the, the worse the crisis, the, the worse if the the worse the crisis gets, the more likely you are to to get action on it. Well, I mean, part of the problem I think is that we've had such gridlock, you know, and so it's the the courts have become more of a, a place to resolve these these problems, these questions. Um, Sarita, you lead jobs with justice, and the idea that all workers should have the right to bargain collectively is in your mission statement. It's in the first sentence of your mission statement. Um, but here in the US, to sort of get to one of Chris's points, we tend to focus more on individual freedoms and that's uh, and individual responsibilities, and we seem to be moving more and more in that direction. So why, um, you know, why is collective bargaining so important, and you know, is it still a relevant uh, framework today? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let me start with my worst job. Uh, thank you all for remembering <laughs> to do that because I keep forgetting. We were all excited to talk about it. <laughs> I also had a telemarketing job, uh, but the one I'm going to focus on is um, I was a server in a restaurant, and um, and frankly, I had to endure a lot of sexual harassment and um, just inappropriate language and behavior towards me uh, because I had to. I was dependent on the tips. Um, and it was definitely, it was a young, young woman um, and really shocked by what was expected of me to endure in order to make sure I could bring the paycheck home. Um, and so that would, by far, later we can tell more stories about that, but have many you know, crazy stories of what it was like to be a server. Um, so I'm going to talk about collective bargaining rights and just share that, um, you know, workers gain power like working women and working men gain power uh, by being able to collectively come together and demand collective rights to negotiate with the people in power around wages, working conditions, like health and safety issues. Like there's so many laws or so many regulations in the workplaces that are negotiated. And that is a result of people's ability to have uh, collective bargaining rights. It is important to say that we've also learned that workers will find ways to collectively bargain regardless of what the law says. And so after Janus, I think that's really important to say. Uh, if you look at history, when Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act in the 1930s, uh, that act did not spring to life because uh, the government passed that law. It was enacted actually in response to a strong labor movement and this desire to sort of tame and regulate a union movement to decrease strikes at that time and to maintain peace, right? That was the whole basis of our legal framework for bargaining rights. Um, and what we found is um, it's important to keep in mind that working people gain power not by changing laws, not by winning, oops, winning cases in courts um, or by winning issues at the ballot box, but by actually being able to come together and uh, demand collective rights it, from people in society who have the power, which means we do win great policy. We can win in the courts. We can win at the ballot box. But that flows from the ability of people to be able to collectively come together, which is the basis of collective bargaining and is an important framework to keep in mind in a moment when we're talking about such dramatic inequality in our economy, in our society. And I'll just say we have so many great examples of, of workers who are, in fact, exercising that right regardless of what the law says. If you look at the West Virginia educators is a great example. And these were educators who had no right to strike, no right to collective bargaining, but fundamentally understood that they had strong collective power, 
right? And they understood that as part of their responsibility was to educate a new generation of West Virginia students, but the cuts in the state budget would in fact is hurting the whole education system. So by aligning community values and interests with their own interests as professional educators, they were in fact able to win big for themselves, for schools, and for all civil servants in the state of West Virginia. And we certainly saw that in Arizona and Oklahoma since. There's multiple examples like that of where workers, care workers in Maine right now, there's a great ballot measure happening around uh, creating access to universal home care for 10,000 seniors and Mainers with disabilities. And part of that initiative actually sets up a trust board that is comprised of care workers themselves in addition to families who utilize that benefit and businesses to actually administer the system. Um, and that means care workers will have access to training, professional development, and set wages and working conditions. These are examples of why collective bargaining is still a really critical and fundamental um, framework for us to hold, because workers will strive for that, regardless of what the law says. OK, thank you. Um, I should also add, uh, we will have time for Q&A uh, at the end of the panel. So please think about your questions and um, be prepared to ask them. Um, we have mentioned a few cases already, but I would like to do sort of a quick round where each of you can bring up a, a case that you think is, um, you know, one of the most important of or newsworthy of the, the of the previous year. It could be state or federal. So um, just name the case and tell us why you think it's important. Um, I guess uh, Evan, we'll start with you again. Sure. Yeah. Well, so I guess um, a case. I thought the Epic Systems case was pretty important, and I. Since uh, Chris is the lawyer, I'll let her give you more details. But I just want to highlight one line from um, Justice uh, uh, Ginsburg dissent, um, where she wrote that basically these these contracts were arm twisting, take it or leave it contracts. And I think that's following on my, my comments earlier about like when when contracts are are bona fide agreed upon contracts or when they're foisted upon workers. Uh, I, I I worry about the the court's interpretation of. Um, uh, when, when a contract is agreed upon, that it is uh, faithfully agreed upon, because uh, there's so many uh, gray areas there. It could be that these contracts were given to the worker on the first day of work, hidden in a pile of paperwork. It could be that they were thrust upon them on a computer screen that they had to click through once they got through their HR jobs. And so I think we just need to think pretty carefully about um, the transparency with which these provisions are being requested and the extent to which workers can actually in good faith negotiate or agree to them before we start uh, in enforcing these types of provisions. Chris? So I, um, thanks for deferring to me on the legal part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope I don't get it wrong. So I do think Epic Systems would be, um, from my perspective, the most important case. And that's not that Janus isn't an important case. But Epic Systems goes right to the heart of workers being able to join together and act collectively. Um, in this case, either through litigation or through a class arbitration, because what Epic Systems upheld was a, a forced arbitration agreement in which the company, the employees uh, signed a contract waiving their right not only to go into court with their claims, but also to join together in a, a mass action in arbitration. And that, I think, really does go to the heart of the ability of workers to seek to vindicate statutory rights uh, in a collective fashion, not set policy, but actually vindicate statutory rights in a collective fashion. It's really interesting, you know, this whole, you ask um, first what, what the change in the law has been, and this whole shift away from courts to arbitration for employment has been in the works for about 25, 30 years. And back in the 90s, something like 2% of private sector employers, uh, non-union employers, uh, imposed forced arbitration agreements on employees. Today, that's 56% of private sector non-union employers. And I'll bet you that after Epic Systems, that share is going to grow even more. Um, and it's really hard to contemplate the notion that working people have a choice uh, which normally means you exercise your choice with your feet, go someplace else. But if overwhelming majorities of private sector employers are requiring workers to waive their rights 
to go into court either individually or collectively. As a condition of employment, there is no meaningful choice. Thanks, Warren. This is a little bit of a different direction, but there's a very interesting Seventh Circuit case recently called Severson that looked at um, when essentially unpaid leave was a, a valid accommodation for uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And partly that's an interesting technical question of how much leave do you have to provide to accommodate someone. But I think it's, it speaks to what will become an, an increasingly important question as we see more states in particular put in place pretty large and generous um, unpaid and paid leave plans. Um, this is kind of a new type of benefit that we have not historically had here and that employers aren't necessarily used to accommodating. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of pressure in those relationships now with employers um, essentially trying to find ways to not have to provide the leave and workers in turn needing to try to find ways to, to vindicate those rights. Um, and then almost step three, then employers looking to try to avoid employing in the first place the people who they think are likely to use the leave, which in turn is going to provide uh, a new basis for a set of discrimination related litigation. And so I think it's just a very good illustration of the way something that at first blush just feels like sort of common sense pro worker policy, well, obviously employers should accommodate more leave, um, ultimately works its way through the labor market in some really interesting ways. Okay. Thanks, Sarita. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, going to mention a National Labor Relations Board decision versus a federal or state decision. Um, uh, the high brand um, industrial contractors limited decision which in which the NLRB essentially overturned a previous decision um, that held or, you know that had laid out when two companies could be considered joint employers um, of an employee and this is really crucial not only in the context of the National Labor Relations Act but it's crucial around minimum wage issues, overtime, employment discrimination, health and safety, like who ultimately is held responsible uh, to make those decisions. Um, and you know, just to say from a worker's perspective, working women and working men are caught in a shell game. Right? They see something's wrong in their workplace. They want to do something about it. They go to one, they go to the employer, and they're told they're not really the employer, it's the other. You know, and so we see so many profitable companies actually utilizing um, decisions like this to escape responsibility um, uh, that really ultimately hurts working people and their ability to really work with dignity um, and have the protections that they need on the job. I'm glad you brought that one up because one question I want to get to at some point in our discussion is this question of who even is your employer these days? Right. And that comes up with uh, you know, the growing gig economy, which is still a fairly fractional part of the, the labor force. But it's not just the gig economy. It's freelancers. It's contractors. Um, it's contingent workers of all kinds, staff, people who come through staffing agencies. The question of who one's employer is, if you are working for a catering company that's catering at a Google cafeteria and you slip and fall, who's liable? You know, all of these kinds of liability questions. I think that's one reason why the, this joint employment uh, decision has been watched so closely is um, there are more and more of these alternative arrangements where you are working on the premises of one company, but your employer is another company. Sometimes you're subcontracted by two layers, and it's getting very confusing to say, like, who, who do I work for? Um, so I th and that also gets to some of the misclassification um, cases, like the Dynamex case in California, which was decided earlier this year. The California Supreme Court came up with a much uh, simpler uh, way to determine whether somebody could be classified as an independent contractor or as an employee. And it's very threatening for companies like Uber and Lyft and TaskRabbit. Um, in fact, while we're on that topic, I wonder if we can just talk a little bit about the misclassification question and this de you know, determination of who is your employer uh, and you know, what makes somebody an employee and where the courts seem to be going on this. It seems there's a lot of split decisions on this kind of thing. Chris, do you want to start? Sure. And you referenced the Dynamex case, which, um, in which the California Supreme Court applied to the labor statutes, a test that it had already applied for unemployment insurance. It's referred to as the 
ABC test, and it's really just a test of um, how much independence an individual actually operates on a, um, uh, has on a job and whether the amount of independence is sufficient for that individual to be called an independent contractor, their own business basically, or whether in fact the person is an employee. And that is the situation that um, prevails throughout much of what we call the gig economy, which as you notice, is actually less than half a percent of the entire workforce, but it gets, it takes up all the oxygen in the room <laughs> in terms of discussion of these issues. And part of that is because um, some of the sort of chief um, drivers of that economy, Uber, um, for example, have been fairly successful at going around state to state and getting special carve-outs um, from state employment laws. Uh, rule, state laws saying that drivers are independent contractors, not employees. Um, there is, as you probably know, there was an effort in Seattle. Uh, Seattle actually passed an ordinance which would have created a mechanism allowing drivers to organize even if they are independent contractors and a, um, a, a bargaining agent basically to, to bargain with these companies. Um, the Ninth Circuit recently struck down that ordinance um, on a, an antitrust basis, um, but left open the possibility because of how antitrust law is written that states could in fact authorize localities to allow independent contractors to organize and to bargain. So I think there may well be some development on those fronts um, in the future, and, and frankly it's not something that Typically in labor law, we've been that exposed to, but it is an opportunity. But at the same time, there may be some action on that front. There certainly is continuing action on the part of all the platform companies, not just Uber, but Handy and others, to basically get carve-outs from all state-level labor, employment, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance laws for the people who do the work for those companies. Mm -hmm. Oren, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, move towards more contingent and independent work and I think it's it's one of the most important things going on and you know the the gig economy per se is a very small portion of the labor market if you look at where there has been growth in the labor market though you know roughly 2005 to 2015 essentially all of the increase in employment was in contingent mm -hmm. relationships whether it's gig or temp or, or on call and so forth um, and so I think it's really important to recognize that one thing that employers are going to do if they are constrained in how they can relate to their employees is to not have employees. Um, it, it is not, I think, especially coherent to think that we are simultaneously going to create a lot of reforms that uh, impose new burdens on employers, say they must subject themselves to large class actions in court, that they can't do the very kind of contracting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that we're <coughs> going to shift more people out of these provisional relationships into full-time employment. Um, from the employer perspective, having full-time employees is actually a good thing. It's, it's in many ways hard to run a business with contingent workers who you don't quite control. So in a vacuum, employers might like that. And I think we would generally like to have workers who can be full-time employees. But if that's a relationship we value, then one of the things we have to ask is, how are we going to make that actually attractive to both sides? Because we can want more collective action on the worker side, but employers are going to do what's in their interests too. And if we think the courts are going to somehow um, you know, play whack-a-mole and shoot down everything employers try to do and build the, the perfect labor market we wish we would have, that's not, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in my mind, the, the priority should really be on saying, no, we want full-time employment. We want to build infrastructure that actually makes employers want to have full-time employees. Um, and, and we should do that in a way that, that ideally with collective bargaining, they can reach good agreements amongst themselves. But we have to recognize that there are things that employers are going to want to take out of that picture, massive class actions being a very important one. And, they are not being irrational or nefarious in feeling that way. They are looking out for their interests as a large employer a lot of times. Um, Evan or Sarita, do you, can you respond to Oren's idea that the more regulations we give to employers, the less incentive they'll have to actually employ people? I think if, if I'm sort of summarizing, oh, simplifying your point, um, 
accurately. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, you know, I feel like, uh, I feel like at the end of the day, working women and working men want to be able to work uh, with, uh, in safe conditions, um, feel like their work is being respected, that there's dignity in the workplace, and um, the ability, the promise of collective bargaining, the promise of the ability of work, working people to come together and be able to, in fact, negotiate collectively on an array of these issues with employers, working with employers to figure out how to make a win-win out of uh, the conditions they're in. We've seen multiple examples of that. That's the history of collective bargaining in America. Working people want the businesses they work for to be successful. That is how they have a job. And so, you know, I don't know that I have an, a direct, it's because it's so abstract, like what regulations are we talking about, et cetera. Do I believe in the 21st century as work is shifting, we need to rethink the pathways and the abilities of working people and employers to come together and actually negotiate agreements that make sense for the business and for working families? Yes. That framework is what we have to continue to hold. And what that means in terms of new laws and new regulations is to be seen, but should come out of that exercise of um, bargaining, uh, which is in this day and age, I feel like the debate often becomes questioning whether we actually need collective power and collective bargaining anymore. And I guess what I'm trying to assert is we need that because that actually helps inform the kinds of regulations and laws that we need moving forward. And, and I'll just say that I, I, I agree with Oren. I think that um, if, if you find it, uh, if, if courts or uh, legislatures were to pass a policy that said that firms can't use independent contractors for X, Y, and Z or pass some regulations. Uh, firms are choosing among an array of alternatives and they could substitute to something else. And so I think that policymakers do need to be really thoughtful in, in the laws they're gonna pass, anticipating what firms are gonna do in, in making policies that uh, um, anticipate that properly. And I think one example, this is in California where uh, in the context of non-compete agreements, California has a policy dating back actually a few hundred years where they've banned the use of non-competes and, uh, and, and when you see in, in California, you actually see non-competes still, but, but what you see a lot more of is trade secret litigation uh, and relative to other places. And that could in part be because Silicon Valley is over there and there's lots of these tech giants, uh, but they have substituted to some degree from, from non-compete litigation towards trade secret litigation. And so, you, you, yeah, it, it, it's kind of a game of whack-a-mole a little bit, and uh, it's unclear which, which mole to whack. <laughs> Chris? So um, I'm not an economist, and I don't even play one. But, but I do think that um, th there's no question that for many employers, a desire to offload compliance responsibilities is a reason to shift to temporary employment, working with contract firms, et cetera. But I think it's a much more complicated picture, quite frankly. I mean, when we first started seeing the rise of temporary employment, in particular, that was in the 90s. It was coming off of a recession. We saw it again. A lot of the rise of temporary employment um, sort of was leading up to the Great, um, great Recession and throughout the Great Recession. In reality, the most recent Labor Department report on contingent employment shows that contingent employment levels are lower now than they were in 2005, which I have to say shocked all of us. I know, but they used a very narrow definition. They did, but it still was quite shocking because um, Orrin is right. I mean, the, the Kruger-Katz yeah. study for 2005, 2015, not only found that all of the growth in employment had been in contingent yeah. work, but that the growth, um, the fastest rate of growth or highest rate of growth was in contract employment, the specialty contract firms um, that, again, I think really kind of took off more in the 90s. And I would only say, lastly, that I think that um, some of the financial incentives that firms have to outsource work do not entirely have to or have more to do with uh, stock value, profit margins, et cetera, than they do with getting out from under labor law and compliance. I'm not disagreeing with your point that that is a factor. I think it is. And, you know, I'm an employer. I have to comply with a lot of, uh, or my organization is, but I'm responsible for ensuring that 
we comply with a lot of standards, not only federal standards, but here in DC and New York and California. Um, and it's for small employers in particular, it can be a lot of work. But I don't think that it is compliance that uh, is the principal driver of a shifting away or a fissuring of the, of the workplace, as David Weil puts it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what we end up with now, and this kind of gets to a point that I want to cover about state and local action. Not, not all of the action, obviously, is at the federal level. We've already talked about California. Um, but we have now ended up with this patchwork, uh, which I think makes it, which is also very onerous for employers, where there's different um, tests for you know, independent contractor versus employee in different states, and uh, no federal, it doesn't seem to be like that there's any one case coming up on that would help to resolve some of this at the federal level. Am I right about that? I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, speak, getting to state and local action, we've had a few very big, big Supreme Court cases, Janus and Epic, but a lot of the important cases are also happening at state level or district court levels. Um, and uh, as Maureen said, we're having this discussion in the shadow of a very interesting Supreme, Supreme Court nomination process that's become even more interesting in the last few days um, with a, a fair amount of uncertainty. But either way, it looks like whatever happens with that seat is going to affect the balance of how labor cases are going to be decided for a few decades now. At the same time, it doesn't look like we're going to get any major legislation from Congress on anything, whether it's the minimum wage or paid leave or, or anything like that. So um, Chris, your organization does a lot of work at the state and local level. I'm really curious, what, uh, what issues are you following or do you think have the most momentum behind them at, at, at that level? So uh, certainly the minimum wage has a fair amount of momentum, um, particularly in blue states. And I would say that's not just at the state level, but at the local level in blue states. Um, uh, we're seeing, and, and then there are a number of ballot measures this year on minimum wage. I think that we are seeing some um, uptick in interest around non-competes, what to do about uh, enforcing non-compete agreements. Um, some of this is legislative. Some of it is through state's attorney general, attorneys general, which um, Evan can speak to. Um, I, I think that we will see some uh, interest in how to not how to get around epic systems, but how to ensure that um, workers are actually sort of knowingly entering into and affirmatively consenting to these agreements. And some of that will be done through legislation, and some of it will be done by courts' careful assessments of the circumstances surround, surrounding the arbitration agreements. Um, so I think we'll see more activity there. We're seeing a little bit of activity in response to Janus in terms of state, um, New York, California, uh, Maryland, some other states, um, making sure that public employees know of their rights to form unions, and also addressing the mandate in um, Janus that if someone wants not to pay an agency fee or union dues, they have to affirmatively uh, they have to be. They have to affirmatively opt in in order to be required to do so. Mm -hmm. So I think those are areas where we're going to be seeing a lot of activity. Okay, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Orin, you mentioned a case that wasn't even on my radar on um, the ADA. What other uh, either cases or issues are you keeping an eye on? I mean, I think the the non compete and non poach space is one where there's a lot of action that's in between attorneys general and legislatures um, related to that, and actually squarely in the employment context in a lot of ways is, is occupational licensing related cases, um, which don't exactly fit the rubric because it's the state in a sense that's the one making the rule, not the employer. Um, but it's a lot of the same underlying rationale about kind of barriers to entry into various jobs, lack of mobility, both across state lines and between professions. Um, and it's a place where people are starting to, to try to create more legal hooks. Um, so one good example is Arizona, which actually has created a cause of action uh, that a worker can essentially bring a lawsuit against a licensing board for an unreasonable licensing requirement um, if it's not to protect health safety and so forth. Um, and the goal of that is not to spur a massive round of litigation, but to actually create pressure on, on these boards to, to go forward and actually 
reevaluate what rules they're making and why. Um, so I think that on top of the non-poached, non-compete is it's a very interesting constellation of bipartisan uh, support and something that could actually start to do a lot to free up worker movement in the labor market and as a result, potentially their power, especially vis-a-vis -vis whoever their existing employer is. Um, Evan, you, a lot of this is, ha the state action is happening around non-competes. It was in Massachusetts yeah. that just passed a, a recent law. Yeah. You mentioned at the very beginning of the panel some yeah. of, you know, the research that you're finding. Maybe can yeah. you tell us a little bit of the results that you're seeing? Sure, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how to make these, if, if these agreements work, how to make them work better for workers, either through legislation or otherwise. Yeah, yeah, great question. So. Um, uh, I started doing some research on this in 2014 mm -hmm. when I was learning that we really didn't know that much about the use of non-competes. There were a few professions that had been surveyed, like um, uh, engineers and doctors, but for the average kind of worker, we didn't know how common non-competes are. And to this day, uh, there's no public repository of the use of non-competes for an average worker. You probably couldn't go to a firm and figure out if they were using non-competes unless you had insider knowledge. And that goes for arbitration agreements and non-solicitation agreements. You might have to dig through court records and you could find out. Um, and their policies could change, of course, but these are generally private contracts, and it's hard to get your hands on private contracts. And so uh, what I did in 2014 was I surveyed about 11,000 workers uh, to learn about the use of these contracts, and we found that roughly one in five workers is bound by a non-compete in the U.S., uh, and they appear all across the spectrum, but they appear with high-earning people, they're more frequently with, with tech, uh, people with access to trade secrets, but they're also common even among volunteers. Uh, among people who aren't paid, and they're even common, or actually just as common in states that don't enforce them as the states that do. And so uh, we, we see that these are pervasive contracts, um, and, and they're not being used in ways that we would have expected. And let me just give you one example, which is that a few years ago, Amazon was found using non-competes with their temporary, temporarily employed packers, which they hire for three months over the holiday season to help them pack all the trucks. And they made these guys sign 18-month non-compete agreements Remember, they're employed for three months, so the, the non-compete uh, time duration is six times longer than they were actually working for Amazon. And the non-compete said they weren't going to go work for anybody who basically produced or manufactured anything that uh, competed with Amazon or intended to compete with Amazon. Uh, and, and, and what happened was, when this came to light, uh, there was a Verge article published um, by Spencer Woodman. Uh, Amazon caught some flack for it, and by the next day, they, they stopped doing it, or they claimed they stopped doing it. And, and the same thing happened with these no poaching agreements that happened recently. Uh, Orly Ashenfelter and Alan Kruger uh, found out that these uh, franchises were basically agreeing, the managers were agreeing not to poach each other's workers. So this is a contract that's invisible to the worker. You don't even know that it's happening. But if you work at McDonald's, you're not allowed to go work at another McDonald's, not because you don't want to, but because the manager over there has agreed not to hire you. And so what happened is uh, this got publicized, and they all dropped, a bunch of these franchises dropped these no poaching agreements. And so I guess one of the big issues that, that, um, that I care about is the transparency of these, of these provisions, because it seems like firms are using them in lots of places where maybe it's questionable whether they should, or it's, it's obviously bad for these workers who maybe are vulnerable and have no choice but to agree to them. Uh, and as soon as it's brought to light, they drop it, which means that just that little bit of cost, just that little bit of negative publicity pushed them over the edge. And so uh, I think that you know, maybe there are workers like CEOs and people who are really in the know whether these things should be used. Uh, and maybe they have lawyers and they negotiate carefully. But in other instances, uh, I think we need to be a lot more careful. And, and the more that we can shed light on firms' use of not only non-competes, but arbitration, non-disclosure agreements, non-solicitation agreements, non-poaching agreements, all of these provisions, which typically come in a bundle, uh, I think we're going to learn a lot more about how uh, these types of provisions are affecting workers, firms, and kind of the economy overall. And I guess I'll just say that um, uh, a lot of the research and discussion around non-competes happens uh, with regards to the law. And there's tremendous heterogeneity across the US in, in what states will do. In some states, you could be fired from your job. And if you get sued over the violation of a non-compete, can, it can still be enforced even though you were fired. Uh, other states, it won't be enforced. And then everyone else is just kind of in the middle. And it, it does look like if you're, if you're in a state, I, I did one study where we tracked workers over eight years of their career. We had every single worker in 30 states over roughly a 20-year period. And what we found is that if you start your career in kind of an average enforcing state, uh, you are going to earn 5% lower earnings relative to a non-enforcing state like California over those eight years, regardless of where you end up, regardless of where you go. Uh, so this, the, the, the enforceability of this contract does appear to, to, pl to play a role. 
Um, but I also want to highlight that the contract itself appears to matter when it comes to workers choosing to move. And so I'll just briefly say, in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of legal literature, there's this idea of a chilling effect, that workers are chilled just by the existence of the contract, regardless of whether it's enforceable or not. And when you ask workers, you know, what do you know about the law? You know, most of them don't know uh, what, the, what the law is. But what their default is, is they believe that contracts they put their name on are enforceable. And they abide by them, even in, even in states like California, where, they're, where they're not, they wouldn't be enforceable if they went to court. And so when it comes to workers choosing to move between jobs, what, what we see is that the use of these provisions appears to be what matters, not necessarily their enforceability in court. And of course, one of the reasons that's important is when people move jobs, they tend to move partly for a higher salary. Exactly. So it restricts yeah. your earnings. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask a question that, that um, it surprises me or interests me that, that discrimination doesn't come up in a lot of important court cases anymore, mm -hmm. discrimination in the workplace. It's one of the things that I get reader emails about more than anything else, particularly mm -hmm. age discrimination. But there don't seem, is this just not a super relevant topic right now? Or is it just harder to find or fight it on a systemic level? I know the EEOC brings plenty of discrimination cases, but they tend to be not you know, sort of headline grabbing cases. They're one-offs. Is this, is this just not a serious problem anymore in the workplace? Um, I think it's still a serious problem in the workplace. Um, I think you know a lot of people who are signing uh, forced arbitration clauses are essentially um, pursuing claims in arbitration. Those are private proceedings. They generally uh, come with non-disclosure agreements, so we don't actually know. But I would also say I think it's just gotten harder to bring these cases that um, the Dukes versus Walmart decision a few years ago, which really tightened the requirements for class certification and, and just made it much harder to bring a large class action employment discrimination mm -hmm. That case. was sex discrimination. That was sex discrimination. Um, and I, it, you know, it is it, one of the concerns about uh, preventing collective arbitration is that for individuals, the cost-benefit analysis, the math doesn't work. Someone, someone may have a few hundred dollars of unpaid wages, but might have to feel that he or she had to have a lawyer to handle the arbitration. It's just not worth it. The same considerations apply to litigation, um, and perhaps even more so because litigation is drawn out. Um, I used to litigate, and I would just as often advise clients not to sue as I would recommend that they sue because it's a grueling process. And it, it not only costs a lot of money, it takes a lot out of people. Um, it's much easier to navigate that process as a class, and it's much harder to bring class cases now. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on that one? Nothing to add. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, just getting back to the, uh, unions and collective action. Um, Oren, you've written about unions as they are currently constructed, big labor, as um, probably not or perhaps not the best um, framework or format for collective bargaining. What you know? What's your criticism of it? And then you know, what do you see as potential <coughs> alternatives? And Sarita already mentioned a few that are already emerging, kind of organically. Yeah, I, I think Sri and I probably agree with a lot in this space. You know, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize, speaking purely to folks on the right, is that in principle, collective action and workers being able to bargain collectively is, is something everyone should be in favor of. That's not a liberal or a conservative idea necessarily. What, what we fight about politically is the National Labor Relations Act, which was passed in the 1930s at a time of massive labor strife in the middle of the Depression at a time when there was no global competition, I mean, just in a completely different context, um, and served some purposes very well for a good period of time. I, I don't think many people would say it has worked well in a very long time. Um, and that's reflected in the statistics that show, you know, down from mid-30s to less than 7% of people in unions. And it's important to recognize that that's not just evil union busters, that's workers also don't especially like the National Labor Relations Act and the kinds of unions it creates. Um, the, there's a wonderful survey in a book done in the mid-90s um, called What Workers Want. 
And what it found was, you know, roughly speaking, a third, maybe more than a th little over a third of workers would in general say that they like the idea of having a union. Now in a system where you have to get more than 50% in every workplace to get a union, that's a recipe for no unions. Even more importantly, I think, when workers were asked, which would you prefer, something like the existing structure of a union that has power but is opposed by management, or a cooperative arrangement that has less power but management supports and wants to work with, the, the less or no power but cooperative relationship was more than twice as popular. Um, that's with, with non-managerial workers. And so what we have in the NLRA is, is a system that is set up to be exceptionally adversarial. You get in there, you fight to get the vote that gets you a union, to have a bargaining agreement that is essentially give us certain things or we will strike. I mean, that's essentially the, the setup we have. Um, and hasn't worked out very well at the end of the day for either the workers in organized firms uh, or for the firms. And so uh, opening up what organizing means, um, allowing arrangements more like what they have in Europe, which is called works councils, encouraging the creation of, of organized labor groups, more like worker centers that aren't tied to the place of employment. They're something you join voluntarily because they provide value to you is really important. And then the last thing, that, that Sarita mentioned, although maybe not in this context, she may wildly disagree with what I'm about to say, <laughs> is that part of the problem is that almost everything unions used to negotiate over is now in the default of federal employment law. Um, and on the one hand, we can view that as a great victory for progress. On the other hand, it means that if you have a union, what, what are they there to negotiate over? It, it now has to be incremental things above federal employment law. And one, I think, really promising opportunity to create space for collaborative agreements, create a situation where employers might actually want to have a union to bargain with, is to say, we're going to take a lot of these regulations and make them the default instead of the floor. So if you don't have collective workers to negotiate with, you get all the federal employment law. But if you have a, an, an equally powerful partner to bargain with, then you can actually bargain over the things we've been talking about. So maybe you know a single low-wage worker, you can't force them into an arbitration clause. But an, an organized union sure as heck should be allowed to agree to some form of arbitration. That looks very different. Or in retail, you know, maybe workers would like to sit down with employers and say, you don't have to pay us time and a half for overtime, but we'll also have to do away with this just-in-time scheduling. And those kinds of agreements are the ones where you start to open up the space, not just for, for what I would characterize as hostage negotiation to some degree, but to actually make it a system both sides want to participate in and that could actually create value for them. Sarita, do you want to add to that or add to the examples you gave earlier? Well, I, I guess I, I just want to, I want to add to the history a little bit in the sense that um, we should also recognize that the history of collective bargaining um, has actually been one of exclusion in this country as well. That um, when the National Labor Relations Act was passed in the 1930s, in order to get it passed and, and get it uh, basically politically maneuver it around, at that time, Southern uh, politicians were blocking its passage, there had to be an agreement to uh, actively exclude uh, wor workers who at that time mostly um, employed or sectors of workers that you know mostly employed women and people of color, particularly black workers in the domestic uh, worker industry and the agricultural sector. And it's important for us to understand and own that history that for decades there have been large swaths of workers who've actually been excluded from uh, uh, being protected under basic labor law and included to have collective bargaining agree um, rights in the first place. And then on top of it, right now, some of the growth sectors that we see in the economy are also the very sectors that um, where these where these exclusions continue to play out. And I, I think we have to own that and understand that as part of this narrative around collective bargaining rights and what we need in the 21st century. One set of workers that are often overlooked are immigrant workers. Immigrant workers who do organize in their workplaces, 
face severe retaliation, and employers know that. So they mistreat their workers. When the workers uh, want to complain, they know they have that leverage of calling ICE on them. So, I don't mean to interrupt, but you mean specifically workers who are not authorized to not be working authorized in the country. Not authorized to be working. Undocumented immigrant workers. That is a huge issue. We see the, I mean, in 2018, we saw a rise of worksite raids that aren't being talked about. Hundreds of workers and communities that are being disrupted in places like North Texas, in East Tennessee, in Ohio. And those are the large scale, where large scales of workers were actually being deported and detained and deported in some cases let alone every day the amount of sort of raids that are happening in workplaces, all because of alleged vi uh, labor law violations uh, at companies. And it's not the companies who are getting punished, it's actually the workers who are getting punished. They're the ones that are being stopped and they're the ones being deported. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. And furthermore, we have a Supreme Court nominee right now that's being considered who actually believes uh, and has written uh, about the fact that he believes that uh, uh, undocumented immigrant workers should not be protected under labor law, right? So that is the climate we're in, in terms of immigrant workers. And then I just want to say a word about uh, other sectors that are growth sectors like the restaurant sector. And when we look at the issue of tipped minimum wage, uh, tipped minimum wage is a huge issue. Uh, and the, there's a lot of campaigns at the state and local level to eliminate the tipped minimum wage uh, so that uh, servers in restaurants or other tipped workers can be included under the broader minimum wage laws. DC is a great example. Just a few months ago, in DC, voters you know, voted in favor of Initiative 77, which would do away with that, uh, the tipped wage. Um, and now, the, and let's be clear, that vote passed largely because of high numbers of voters in communities of color who understood what was at stake. And <clears throat> I just want to make sure we get yeah, to Yeah, I just want to just say the last piece is that now the city council is actually planning to go against the will of the voters to repeal Initiative 77. So those are examples of the ongoing barriers that many women and people of color face when they attempt to take collective action and collective power and actually negotiate at all these um, levels that we're talking about. I, I just think it's I, we need to lift that up and surface it in this mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, Feel free to tweet your questions using hashtag talkgoodjobs, and we'll take some questions from the folks here in the room. Um, sure, up in front. Um, There's a microphone coming. Um, hi, my name's Nat Ware from Asterix. We've talked to, in terms of the future of work, we've talked a lot about people in work. One of the major issues that's going to be uh, at stake in the next decade is just how do we reskill and retrain people, uh, particularly the one in five workers who are expected to become unemployed due to technological advances such as AI and robotics. Uh, so my question is, what do you see the role of the courts in terms of financing education and particularly new ways of financing education that might be proposed over the coming decade? I'll, I'll say something about that. I, I guess I would say two things. One is, I think we have to be very skeptical of the claims that technology is, is going to suddenly and, and differently disrupt the labor market. Um, certainly, there's no way to prove it won't happen, but none of the current data suggests it is happening. Productivity growth, the rate at which we need fewer workers to do a given amount of work, is essentially at an all-time low. Um, job churn within and across industries is at an all-time low. Um, if anything, we, we need to wish that, that that was happening a lot faster than it is. And so um, what we are likely to see in the future actually looks a lot like what we've seen in the past, which obviously is a policy challenge that we should address. But it's not, I think, a kind of unique or, or singular one that's coming. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that this is a quintessential example of where courts don't have a role to play. Um, how, how to fund and design the programs for retraining is something that courts have no expertise in and no democratic legitimacy to, to play a role in. And, and my hope would be they stay far away from it. Anyone else? Well, I would just say I, I completely agree with Orr. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you know the predictions about how automation and technology are going to displace workers and result in massive unemployment are just all over the place. But we're not seeing it. And um, 
and these predictions had been there now for five years or so. So I think that they are overstated. I do think that, that as a nation, we suffer from not having um, sound national industrial policy that really reflects on what changing trends are, uh, um, uh, you know, emerging economies um, trends underway, and how do we invest appropriately both to provide skills for workers um, in transition and to provide the kind of basic supports workers need when they lose their jobs as a result of economic transformations. Yeah. But we've had that problem for quite a long time. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Um, in the middle, sir? Yeah. Thank you. I understood, uh, David Jacobs, I, I understood Orrin Cast to be suggesting that if we deregulated, good employers would be inclined to provide good jobs because it's a reasonable proposition to have people work in a committed relationship who generate profits for everyone. But I'm afraid there's an actor in the room that we haven't mentioned, and that is the notion of private equity, the interests that are engaged in pushing companies to behave differently, and even urging companies to sell off assets and entirely uh, destroy the prospects of a good community enterprise. There's a great deal of pressure moving in that direction, and it makes it less likely that employers behave responsibly and commit themselves to their work workforces. And there, it seems to me that there used to be organizations in this country with a business labor orientation that said, here, this is a good employer. Let us all follow the pattern of good employment practices. And the groups that did that, the National Planning Association, and of course, American Rights at Work, uh, there's not really much celebration of good employers anymore because they're disappearing. <laughs> they're being pushed by these aggressive uh, in investment firms to do something else, sort of destroy the very notion of a community-based enterprise. Yeah. Me, I'll, I'll say, I mean, I, I think it's a very fair concern and critique. I think it is most, I mean, one response to that would be to, to say, well, we should somehow sort of regulate that kind of investment activity out of existence, which I would be skeptical of accomplishing or that ultimately it would be a constructive thing to do. I think the, the better way to, to address the issue is to step back and ask, what are the conditions that make this an attractive thing to do? So you know, I think Chris made a fair point that when we talk about why are employers pushing employees away, it's not just compliance, it's share price and profits and all that. But it's, it's a little bit a, a question begging observation because share price isn't a, a, an abstract thing. It responds to the business realities, profit responds to the business realities of the business. So the question is why is having actual full-time employees not a good path to profit if that is something that has changed and happens? I think everything that we've done to make employment relatively more costly and less attractive is a component of it. But then I think we have to look across a whole bunch of areas. How well do we prepare people for the labor force, especially less skilled workers? What kind of organized labor relationships do we have so that you might actually benefit from having somebody, a partner to bargain with? Do we impose a lot of taxes, including payroll taxes, on less wage workers? Or maybe we should actually subsidize those jobs instead. So I think the constructive way to have the conversation is to ask at the business level, why why is this not the kind, if, if that kind of business activity, full-time employment, it, we all agree has social value and we want more of, why are we getting less of it? And what conditions could we change to get more of it? Not lecturing or complaining to employers, but actually influencing economic realities so that we get what we want. Sarita, do you want to add anything to that? You've been uh, no, I mean, I, I appreciate the question, and you're absolutely right to lift it up. It was an unnamed actor in all of this, and uh, a lot of the campaigns that we work on at the state and local level, and even, frankly, in global supply chain, um, the role of private equity firms are um, have been problematic in terms of getting to these questions that we're talking about. And you know, I agree, we need to have constructive spaces where we're talking about how we actually um, solve this problem, but they are a huge actor that we need to spend some time thinking thinking about. Um, in the back? Um, Luis Garcia. Oh. There you go. Hello. Um, my name is Luis Garcia, and I have a question for Oren, just based on what you said about, you know, we have to make sure that we are working with employers, training the employees, and um, so I am running a reentry program uh, for ex, ex, 
incarcerated youth. And um, we are in California, we are in Puerto Rico, and both places are suffering greatly, just one because of um, uh, the financial situation in Puerto Rico because it's just been left out. And so we are meeting with the Workforce Investment Boards. We're asking, what are you looking for? Where are the areas of growth? What can we do? And so we are training the participants in those areas that we believe that are the areas of growth. But um, we are running a wall with finding employers that are willing to hire these participants and give them the opportunities due to their um, background. And so I guess my question comes to, you know, what can uh, the courts do uh, in, in order to provide support to this community that has been put aside, um, especially because we are not, I mean, I can provide the training, I can provide the money, but we cannot provide that opportunity for the growth and the employment. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what else you know can, can be done in that case. Yeah, I'd, I'll say a little bit about workforce reentry. I, I think some of these folks probably know more about it than I do. I mean, prisoner reentry is a, is a sort of specific subset of all of these challenges. And so something we've seen in the US more generally is when the labor market gets tight enough, um, employers will even start figuring out how to do things like, like prisoner reentry more effectively. I think the key mechanism, whether you're talking about that context or just less skilled workers and a skills gap generally, is to recognize that government is very good at some things, um, collecting and spending money in particular, and very bad at other things, uh, identifying the key skills that are actually in demand and how to provide them in the ways employers want. And we unfortunately have a lot of data across a lot of programs, across a lot of years, that government-led training and retraining programs tend to have very poor outcomes. Um, and that, that having the employer be the one who is in charge of the training is hugely important to the process. Now, to make that work, it's something that we're going to have to be willing to pay for. And that, again, is something that doesn't sound as appealing as saying, well, we should order employers to do this. But if, if we want employers to get involved early with less skilled workers who have more training up that need to be done and see it in their interest, then we have to give them a seat at the table, even at the secondary education level. We have to be willing to subsidize some of those jobs in their early stages. And again, we have to be willing to create an environment in which having those employees is, is an attractive thing, not a liability. Um, and so that, that's sort of how I would think about it generally. So thank you so much for that question. Um, I, Nell actually does a lot of work in the fair chance hiring space. Um, and we have, and we're involved in some of the state campaigns related to occupational licensing and the ban the box campaigns around the country. And we actually, a few years ago, did a project with Kaiser in California um, to really try to bring employers into the space of the growth sectors in healthcare, because that is a growth sector of the economy, and um, making the case for why it was important to, to hire p trained people who had records. And I have to say, we had sort of mixed results. And it is, I think it's the problem you identified that there are some employers that are exemplary. Kaiser was exemplary around this. There are others that for that just you know, can't get past that someone has a record. Some of it may be state laws that um, create some kind of liability if someone with a record commits a crime of some sort. Um, but it has been a sort of hard nut to crack in terms of really, and, and we featured, and we, we did a road show basically, and in every single place we brought in employers who had made an effort to hire people with records, well-trained people with records, to make, to proselytize about why this is actually a good business practice. And it was just, we didn't get the kind of take up we had hoped we would get from other employers. So I'd be happy to talk to you about the work we've done in California if you'd like to. Uh, in the back. Hi, Malcolm O'Dell. Uh, if I hear it right from back here, I seem to be a couple of themes came out. One, we can't count on the courts for anything to do to really support labor. The, 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 in fact, the courts are moving the other way. So 
we can't, that's not a place where we're going to get any results, and we don't have any influence over the courts. Uh, second, we don't think co Congress is going to do anything about getting laws into place that then can be brought to the courts and ch change that situation. But third, we did hear that collective action, whether it's through unions or just in the streets or groups organizing, collective action brings results. Whether or not the courts or the industries or government does anything, collective action has an impact. And that looks like the most promising avenue for action. So here we are, a room full of people. What should we be doing to, be, to promote more of that kind of collective action? Uh, I mean, do we need to go to the streets? Or do we need to <laughs> encourage people to go to the streets? Or do we uh, work through NGOs, non-government civil society, uh, to encourage more collective action of one form or another? What do we do? I'm happy to answer that question. <laughs> um, I mean, there's so much to be done. I think the big thing is to support wor working wi women and working men who every day are taking risks to take collective action because in our current climate, it is a risk. When a worker stands up and speaks out around sexual harassment in the workplace or it talks about um, uh, wage theft or talks about uh, a whole range of issues. So one is to really support that. Um, and there's lots of different ways. There, you're absolutely right to name. There's lots of civil society groups that are uh, promoting and supporting those kinds of actions on behalf of individuals and groups of workers who want to take collective action to change their conditions. Um, so that's one. I think the second, for some of you in this room who are policy advocates, who are um, thinking about these questions so deeply, is to support the kinds of innovations that are happening right now. I mean, I mentioned a couple, like I mentioned uh, the care workers in Maine um, who are attempting to build a whole new system of care by which they have a real voice and stake at the table. Uh, we need to support those kinds of efforts, whether it's through your pocketbooks or whether it's through you know people in Maine and encourage them to vote the right way or whatever the case may be. Like There's ways to support from an advocacy role um, these kinds of innovations that are happening. Um, and I think taking uh, to the streets when we see um, unjust reactions to people taking collective action is really important as well. Um, uh, because there is a lot of retaliation. Like what we're not, another piece I would just say that's not talked about enough is uh, working men and women who speak out in the workplace who are in fact retaliated against. They're fired for speaking out. They're fired for taking, uh, deciding to do a one day strike and exercising some of their rights. Um, how are we as a community and a society actually standing together? And I think it's something that Oren said that I want to like lift up is this, as a society, this is about our values. If we really believe that people should, in fact, have the right to take collective action and have collective power in the way that we're talking about, then we need to say that, and we need to talk about it, and we need to act from that value and those interests, rather than what I feel like I've seen in the last three decades, which is we're meek and we're quiet and we don't sort of say and assert that this is actually fundamental to our democracy um, and the health of our democracy. So those would be some thoughts. Can I add one thing that's just because mm -hmm. it's an optimistic point, unlike most of the things I say, I suppose. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think it's right to think that we're not going to see anything out of Congress. I think we don't see anything out of Congress and haven't for 30 years because the structure that we have is Democrats want to lift up NLRA unions who essentially translate fairly heterogeneous political views into uniform Democrat political contributions, and Republicans who think, well, that's just great if that dies, essentially. Um, there's no room for, for a great bargain there. There should be room for something simple, and this is technical but important. Section 8A2 of the National Labor Relations Act says, until you have a formal union in your workplace, you can't do anything else collective in partnership with an employer. That's really, really silly. And there's no reason people from the left who want to see new and alternative modes be available and people from the right who want to see that can't get together and say, 
let's just take out that provision. We're not going to hurt any unions that exist, but we're going to let other options exist. Those kinds of, of agreements are places where there could absolutely be opportunity if we moved away from more unions, less unions, and toward what would different unions look like. I just would add one thing. I think it's really important to keep an eye on what's happening in the states yeah. and to be active in the states um, because it, we are seeing innovation in the states, both innovation and legislation. And I, I, as a lawyer, I don't want to give up on the courts. And I want to give one example of a case that we've been involved in. The city of Birmingham passed a minimum wage ordinance um, earlier this year. And, and the Alabama state legislature tried to preempt the ordinance by uh, passing preemption before the ordinance was enacted. The um, Birmingham uh, City Council got ahead of the legislature and passed the ordinance, and then the legislature nullified the ordinance and adopted preemption across the state. And not surprisingly, the city of Birmingham is a black city. The city council is a black city council. Alabama's legislature is mixed, but um, the Alabama legis it, it, the vote was not just a party line vote in the legislature, it was a color vote, color line vote. Um, we were involved in filing a lawsuit against basically the state of Alabama, uh, arguing that it was motivated by intentional race discrimination in nullifying Birmingham's ordinance and preempting minimum wage across the board. The district court dismissed that lawsuit. Uh, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals about six weeks ago reinstated the lawsuit and said plaintiffs may not be able to prevail, but given the history uh, in this state in terms of, um, I won't go into all the details, but given the history that would give rise to this kind of legislation, they have a right to try to demonstrate that intentional discrimination was the cause. So whether they'll ultimately prevail remains unseen and what would happen at the Supreme Court I don't want to talk about. But <laughs> I do think that courts can, and I think there the court was doing its job. It was saying they have a right to prove intentional discrimination. And the whether um, this should not be the goal of the courts, but those kinds of decisions can actually push legislators to act differently and help encourage collective action on the part of ordinary people. We have time for a couple more here in front. So my name is Eddie Eiches, and for most of my career, I was president of a, union, of a federal worker union. And as to courts, uh, uh, President Trump uh, issued three executive orders that would have destroyed uh, federal unions. And the federal district court uh, on August 25th uh, reversed fed, uh, uh, Trump. And quite frankly, they haven't even appealed yet. So there's a question whether they will pursue it. Uh, the federal unions are open shops, and in fact, the Justice Department in Janus argued that these were great models until uh, Trump issued those executive orders. Uh, but I think, and I do want to also say that, that is that there's hope with the courts, but there's also hope with unions. I mean, unions are more popular now than ever, and no one can deny the, uh, the vote in Missouri where... Uh, they turned down the right to work for less. The people turned it down, and these were Trump voters and, uh, and uh, people who opposed Trump. And I think that uh, Sorry, we shouldn't you, discount you that. Question? Do you have a question? Uh, OK, I mean, I, I, just, I just, and I'd like you to comment on, one, the popularity of unions, and, the union, and, and two, that, as you said, you, know, you took it away at, already that there is hope for, for, federal, for federal courts and other courts to rule in our favor. Thank you. So I guess uh, let me just start briefly on that. And I think that there is dramatically more interest in unions. I, I hear it in, in, in many different circles. And it's hard to kind of quantify exactly how much more interest there is in unions than there was, say, five or 10 years ago. But I, I think if we, if we cast the kind of bigger picture that over the last 30 years, there's been a decline in, in mobility of workers across jobs. The, the median wage has been relatively stagnant for the last, uh, for the last I don't know, decade or so. And uh, in general, there's this question of well, productivity still been going up, but, but wages are flat. So how, how, can, how can we kind of increase wages? And I think policymakers for the last few years, especially with the end of the Obama administration, were really concerned about that issue. And I think they brought light to uh, unions in, 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 in the way that unions bargain for, for workers. And I think that's kind of what's maybe spurred some of this 
interest in unions. But I think the bigger picture is that, uh, at least from, from, from an economist perspective, uh, as a labor economist, our default has been that labor markets are competitive. And in a competitive labor market, workers can freely move from job to job. And because of that threat of mobility, they can earn basically what they, what their, their marginal product. And so what, what's come about, I would say, in the last, I don't know, decade, uh, 15 years or so, is this emergence that labor markets are really not competitive at all. And sometimes they're not competitive because search frictions are large. Sometimes it's because of uh, um, uh, mobility frictions are large. It's costly to move across states, or you have to stay in a particular school district, or there's a contract that says you can't go work at a competitor. And I think that what, what we're learning is that, uh, that, that labor markets most of the time are not competitive at all. Um, in particular, there's a push uh, to, uh, to review uh, mergers as part of uh, labor market monopsony power now, where now if, if, two, if two companies merge together, that means that workers who had two, two, two firms to work at now only have one. And so I feel like the, 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 the bigger picture is how do we make labor markets more competitive? We, we've kind of recognized that we're not at this competitive ideal. In fact, we're quite far from it. And unions are one of the pieces, uh, and there's other ones as well that could help us push push towards a more competitive labor market, such as things like wage transparency, uh, such as things uh, like non-competes and these other provisions that, that might hold some workers down, such as occupational licensing. And there's, there's just lots of, lots of uh, emphasis on making markets more competitive. And I guess that'd be my response to the question in the back there, that unions are one great solution. They're, 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 getting, they're getting lots of, lots of uh, emphasis. And there is some new evidence which shows that when unionization fell, inequality was rising. And so I, I think that like unions are getting their due, and it's unclear what's going to happen. But there's also lots of other mechanisms that we're learning about that we could maybe pull to try to increase labor market competition. Mm -hmm. um, let's take one more question. Uh, the woman in red. Uh, hi. My question is for Mr. Koss. You mentioned um, the rise in occupational licenses and the Arizona lawsuit. Um, for occupational licenses that are out of the scope of health and safety. And I'm wondering uh, what other interests drive occupational licensing? Is it discrimination or is it, um, could it be part due to collective bargaining for higher pay rates with occupational licensing? And I'm wondering, um, could you talk a little bit more about Arizona and um, what, how you think occupational licensing should be reformed? Yeah, sure. I, you know, occupational licensing, the political economy of it is fascinating. In general, it's an issue where the industry regulates itself. You have people who are already in the industry choose and run the licensing board that create barriers to entry into the industry. Um, that's an oversimplification, but roughly speaking, that's what happens a lot of the time. Um, it's also a, a case generally of you have a very concentrated interest on one side and a very diffuse interest on the other. So pick your industry, and you've got people banging down the doors of the, leg of the typically it's state legislature, insisting that if you don't put this protection, this protection, this protection in place, everyone's, you know, people are going to die. Um, and you end up, unfortunately, with a situation where, like, interior designers need X hours or years of training, and um, cosmetologists need 10 times more training than emergency medical tech. You know, this. So, um, I think at this point, the political economy of it is pretty well understood. The question of what to do about it is actually very challenging, because the federal level, you would have a lot of resistance to just sort of the feds coming in and decreeing everyone's licenses out of bounds. Um, you actually have an interesting antitrust theory that's starting to move forward, um, and that this administration is looking at to actually treat these sort of self-regulated licensing boards as, as antitrust violators. Um, but I think most of the action is and will be at the state level where you have reformers trying to figure out how can we get a wedge into that process, that self-regulating process. And so what I just described in Arizona is one example where you actually say, let's just let any worker essentially challenge a rule if they want to. Um, but then you also have other models where you actually try to get the legislature engaged in, let's at least have sunset provisions, let's have five-year reviews, let's require the governor or some other group to, to approve anything before it goes into effect. So it's, it's all sorts of different ways of how do you put checks and balances into a process that's right now mostly sort of driven by industry capture. We're about out of time, and so I'm going to cut it here. Um, Maureen, do we have time for a follow-up, or should we do this in, uh, after we've adjourned? 
very quick. Uh, you had said there are a lot of good things we can do, and there are a lot of NGOs. Before each of you leave, will you leave a list of the NGOs, the civil society movements, the, the action that we could be following up with your efforts? supporters here. We want some specifics. Thank, thank you for that. I love the question about what can we do. That's a fabulous question. So we will follow up with them all and try to make some resources available. And if you're interested in getting those resources, you know, share a card with me or some of my colleagues here, and we'd be happy to, happy to share that with you. Um, and so we are at time. So I do want to thank our fabulous, fabulous panel. They were awesome. I learned a lot, um, and I really appreciate this discussion. And I hope you all come back October 29th. We'll be talking about um, job quality and how businesses can do something to job, drive job quality, and how do we know. So we're going to be sharing some new ways of thinking about how do you measure that. So come talk about that October 29th. And thank you all so much. All right, thanks again.